So the next step in doing meta-analysis is that you have to calculate and pool effect sizes. Step four. In this step, I will talk about how you can calculate effect sizes, how you can pool the results, the, the pool, pool the effect sizes of the different studies. I will say something about software you can use for conducting meta-analysis. I will try to show you how you can interpret the forest plot in a meta-analysis, which is basically a summary of your meta-analysis. And I will say something about how you can interpret the pooled effect size. But first, how you ca can you calculate effect sizes? <clears throat> it depends on the outcome you look at. In psychological treatments, you usually look at continuous outcomes, levels of depression, levels of anxiety, quality of life. Uh, and if you calculate effect sizes based on continuous outcomes, you need the mean and standard deviation uh, from the treatment and the control group. You can also do meta-analysis on dichotomous outcomes. Yes or no. Somebody is ill or is not ill. As somebody is dead or is not dead. Um, you can do meta-analysis on other types of outcomes, but that's beyond the scope of this course, so I won't go into that. If you calculate effect sizes based on continuous outcomes, what you need is the mean and standard deviation and n, the number of participants, in each of the two groups you're comparing, psychotherapy versus control group. If you have these data, mean standard deviation and n, you can calculate Cohen's D. Cohen's D is the mean of the two groups uh, that uh, distracted from each other and divided by the pooled standard deviation of the two groups. Hedges G is the same as Cohen's D, only with a little, uh, another way of calculating the pooled SD, and it adjusts for a small sample bias. So if you have more studies with smaller sample sizes, you better use HSG instead of Cohen's D. This is just what a uh, effect size indicates. You have a treatment group with a normal distribution and a control group with a normal distribution, and the effect size indicates the difference between these two in terms of standard deviations. Often in trials, the standard deviation is not reported. So you have to use other statistics to make a, to calculate them into the standard deviation. So you, you, if they report the 95 confidence interval around the means, then you can convert that to the standard error. And if they only use the, the report the standard error, you can transform that to the standard deviations using these formulas. If you have only exact p-values or t-values or f-values, the f-values should only indicate the difference between two groups. Uh, then you can also use uh, calculate effect sizes using software packages. Uh, and of course you can also do that by hand, but that's too specialized. If you want to calculate effect sizes from baseline to post-test within one group, you also need the correlation between the pre-test score and the post-test score. And that's often difficult because most studies do not report that. So in the end, you will get an Excel file like this if you get the data from these studies. So you have, here you have three studies. Uh, with three outcome instruments, A, B, and C. The studies are, uh, uh, two studies report two outcome instruments, one study only one. And here you have the means, standard deviations, and N for, for the control group and the therapy group. Basically, this is what you need to calculate effect sizes and to enter into the software package later. So this, I, I will just give an example how you read such a paper and get the data, the relevant data, out of it. This is a paper one of my PhD students recently published in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. 
on a web-based guided self-help intervention for employees with depressive symptoms. And so if you look at the PDF of this study, you have uh, here you see all the pages. Here is a table with all the relevant information, but you have, of course, read the whole paper. But you focus on that table where the data are. And here you see all the data that are relevant for, the, for calculating effect sizes. Uh, it, it's here. Uh, the CESD is a measure of depression. And that's where you focus on in the meta-analysis. And these are exactly the data you need to calculate the effect sizes. The intervention group, the control group, and for each of those groups, you have the mean, standard deviation, and n of the conditions. And this is enough to calculate the effect size. One problem with effect sizes is that it's not very easy to interpret, for example, for patients or for therapists, because um, if you want to explain to a patient what the benefits of a treatment are, you should say, well, if you get this treatment, you score 0.3 standard deviation better on depression than when you don't receive this treatment. So no patient will understand what you're talking about. And many clinicians don't understand that either. So a very useful way of making that more comprehensible is to transform effect sizes into numbers needed to be treated. There are several methods to do this. Uh, uh, the most straightforward way is developed by Kramer and Kupfer. It's not the best method, but it's the most straightforward. And that has the advantage that each effect size directly corresponds with one uh, value for numbers needed to be treated. Numbers need to be, needed to be treated indicate the number of patients you have to treat with one uh, treatment in order to have one more positive outcome than in the alternative condition. So a number is needed, so an effect size of let's say uh, 0.1 uh, gives uh, indicates an, a number is needed to be treated of 18, which means that you have to treat 18 patients in order to have one more positive outcome than no treatment of that of that group of patients. You can also calculate effect sizes based on dichotomous outcomes. But then usually you work with odds ratios or relative risks. And here you see what exactly odds ratios and relative risks are. And these odds ratios and relative risks can be directly entered into software uh, for doing meta-analysis. So if you look, for example, um, uh, if you collect data based on dichotomous outcome, this is a table you would you need in order to calculate the effect sizes. The number the total number in the treatment group, the number of events in the treatment group, the total number in the control group, and the number of events in the control group. And this allows you to calculate relative risks or odds ratios or risk differences in these, uh, within these studies and also calculate a pooled relative risk or odds ratio. So then you have collected these data for all these studies, and you have calculated effect sizes for each of these studies, how do you pool that? How do you calculate pooled effect sizes? Well, pooling means that you combine or integrate the results, the effect sizes in the individual studies into one overall estimate of the true effect size. Um, the, that has several advantages over the individual effect sizes from the individual studies. They're more precise, you can detect smaller effect, uh, effect sizes, and you can also examine uh, different groups of studies, do, so do subgroup analysis or moderator analysis. So you just it means that you calculate uh, the mean of the effect sizes. And basically, the idea is that if you have a large study, that should weigh more heavy than a small study. 
And if you would, if you would just calculate the, the mean of the effect sizes, that would mean that a small study of 20 participants would be as important as a study of 1,000 participants. So that's not correct. And what you do in a meta-analysis is you just calculate the mean of the effect sizes while adjusting for the size of the study. That's the basic idea. Uh, there are two basic methods of pooling. You can pool according to the random effects model and according to the fixed effects model. If you pool according to the fixed effects model, you, pool, you assume that all the studies are exact replications of each other. So, for example, you have a medication which, from which you ex assume that it works the same way in patients in North America, Europe, or China. And it doesn't really matter whether those patients are poor or rich or whatever. And you as assume that all studies are estimates of a from the same, they all point in the same direction. There are no differences between the studies. In the random effects model, you allow each study to introduce some of its own heterogeneity. So you, um, uh, it's, it's a little more conservative. The 95 confidence intervals are somewhat broader than in the, uh, than in the fixed effects model, but you allow that there are some kinds of differences, small differences between studies. And I think that in our fields, in psychological treatments, we should always use the random effects model in um, uh, meta-analysis. <coughs> so if you think about choosing between the random or the fixed effects model, I think for all complex interventions like psychological treatments or uh, case management or uh, other complex interventions, there are always differences between studies saying that you should use the random effects model. Um, and I would say that you, that, you, that you should always use that random effects model unless you're absolutely certain that there is no heterogeneity between those studies. And I will show later that it's very difficult to show that there is indeed little heterogeneity. And even when you find uh, statistical, very little indication for statistical uh, heterogeneity, but if the uncertainty around that is very high, I still think that you should choose the random effects model because it's more conservative. So what about software to do these meta-analysis? You can, you can do meta-analysis in all kinds of software packages. You have Stata, you have SPSS and SAS, and there, there are specific um, uh, macros available developed by David Wilson, who is an expert in the field of meta-analysis. You can download them for free. You can use the software developed by the Cochrane Collaboration, which is called Review Manager. It's also available for free. Um, but I still think that comprehensive meta-analysis is the best uh, software package at this moment available, and it's the easiest to use. You can download a free trial version from this website, and the big advantage is, is that, it's, that, that, that it's, uh, it's, it allows you just to copy and paste from a spreadsheet, data from a, you have collected in a spreadsheet, just put it in CMA, Comprehensive Meta Analysis, and run your analysis with one push on the, bottom, uh, on the, on the button. And the advantage is that most, not all, but most sophisticated analysis are available in comprehensive meta-analysis. So I, they don't pay me to say this, but I do think that it's the best software package available at this moment. So there are all kinds of tutorials available. Uh, here you see the website again, and you have all the tutorials in which the developer of this package explains how you enter data, how you do your basic analysis, and how you do all kinds of advanced analysis step-by-step by, step by working through 
the software. So you can you you can download that trial version. Um, uh, at, uh, I will show you briefly how it works here. This is when you open comprehensive meta-analysis, you get this screen, and I will show some brief, uh, very briefly how it works. This is the opening screen. If you look in the menu, you click on insert, then you get a new menu. You first click on study names, and then you do that again and click on outcome names. You get this um, uh, uh, screen. And there you can just fill in or copy the study names and the outcome names. If you want to enter data for calculating effect sizes, you again click on insert uh, and then um, uh, add effect size data in the new menu. And then you get a new uh, screen like this. You continue to the next screen and you get all the possibilities, all the different ways of calculating effect sizes in the software and then you click on continuous measures and for most meta-analysis you can use mean standard deviations and n uh, so you click on that click on finish you click on ok and then you here you see the screen you you then get and i have filled in the data which i gave in an earlier sheet uh, with the example, uh, uh, not really, not real data, but just for illustrative purposes. Just this is just what just what you get. You can you can just enter mean standard deviation and, and copy and paste it from a spreadsheet. Indicate the direction of the effect size. Do people improve or not improve? And then you, basically you can run your analysis. So what you uh, you you have to for, have to. Uh, indicate the direction, which can be, a, you have to think about that. So uh, if you, if people get better, score better in the therapy uh, than in the control group, I, I would say that's a positive effect. Uh, and so you, you, you uh, in the software, you have to indicate that that's a positive effect and uh, that if, if the treatment group is worse off, than the control group, then it's a negative effect. But you can also do it the other way around. That doesn't really matter as long as you do it consequently. What you also see in this screen is that if you have entered these data, you get the, you get the values for the effect sizes and our standard errors. So here you stand, see the standard difference in means, which is Cohen's D. And you see Hedges G with the standard error. And then you are ready to run your basic analysis. You click on this button, run analysis, and then you get to a new screen. Don't forget that you are in the, in, below in the screen. You can choose for the model you want to work with, and we always work with a random effects model. So you just push uh, the random uh, button here. And here you see the summary of the, uh, uh, of the meta-analysis. Three studies with a pooled outcome um, you can click on this button and then you get into a new screen which is more informative than this one so you, here you see the outcomes for the fixed and the facts effects model um, you see also see i squared i will come back to that later because that's an indication of heterogeneity um, and you can the nice thing of cma is that it's also possible to directly export a high resolution plot which you can download in other software in word or powerpoint to put into your published meta analysis you can also examine for example if you click on the analysis button uh, you can uh, look for publication bias here you see the three studies in a funnel plot and what you see here is that there are no missing studies. I will come back later how you should interpret uh, this. So, but so as, as you see, it's very easy to use. Just copy the data from your Excel sheet to uh, CMA, push the run analysis button, and you get your outcomes. But how can you interpret the forest plot? What exactly does it mean? Well, basically, it's an excellent summary of a meta-analysis. It gives a summary of each of the individual study effects. 
uh, the effect size and the 95 confidence interval, but also of the pooled outcome, and you can examine outliers. So this is a, uh, a forest plot which I took from a, a recently published meta-analysis from Kathy Griffiths uh, from Australia in World Psychiatry. And what she did here, uh, it's about personal stigma and social distance. And what you, what you see here is that she ordered the effect sizes from the highest to the lowest. You can also, you can, or, you can present it in any way you want. Most people present it just uh, in a alphabetical order on the, F, the, the, the name of the author. But this is also very good. So there's, there's no reason uh, to do, not to do this. What you see here is for this is, this effect size indicates the study from Kuropoulos. Um, this is the 95 confidence interval around that effect size. And here you see the pooled effect size. This is also, this first study is also an outlier. And how can you see that? Well, if you look at the pooled effect size at the bottom and the effect size from Kiropolis, they don't, those 95 confidence intervals don't overlap. From all the other studies, you can see that the 95 confidence interval they overlap with the, those with the confidence interval of the pooled effect size. So that's, uh, there's no significant difference between these studies and the pooled outcome. But for Kiropoulos, there is, that does differ significantly. And what you should do with an outlier like this is examine why this is an outlier. So you have to very look, look very carefully to that study and try to examine what the reasons are why this is an outlier. But the nice thing of the forest plot is that you can see it directly um, uh, uh, in such a plot. Well, this is, this is another example. <coughs> no, just to, just to show you how these forest plots look like. So how should you interpret the pooled effect size? Well, Cohen, when he developed the Cohen's D, the standardized mean difference, he made a rough estimate of what is small, moderate, and large. And he said, well, an effect size of 0.2 is small, 0.5 is moderate, and 0.8 is large. There, that is not based on empirical data. A few years later, Lipsy and Wilson, by that time there were already several hundreds of meta-analyses, and what they did is they took all those meta-analyses together and they looked, they, they looked how large are these effects, and they had a more uh, data-based indication of what large, small, and moderate are, and you can see these values here. You have to remember that, uh, that an effect size is still only a statistical measure and that is not directly related to a clinical relevant outcome. So an effect size is not more than a statistical outcome, not a clinical outcome. So for example, if you would find an effect size of 0.1 in, which indicates the difference between a treatment and control group in terms of years of survival, then most clinicians would consider that to be a major breakthrough. If you would have, on the other hand, an effect size of 0.1 on, for example, social skills or knowledge on anxiety, then most people would not consider that to be clinically relevant. So that same effect size of 0.1 can be highly important, clinically important, or it can be unimportant. And it's still that same effect size of 0.1. So the key points here. Cohen's D indicates the difference between a treatment and a control group at post-test in terms of, a, of standard deviations. You can use many other statistics and Basically, anything with a standard error can be pooled in meta-analysis. Pooling means that you integrate the results of individual effect sizes into one overall effect size. 
And if you do a meta-analysis, then the forest plot of the individual studies and effect sizes is an excellent summary of that meta-analysis. And effect sizes are a statistical measure, and uh, you could say that an effect size of 0.2 is small, 0.5 is moderate, and 0.8 is large.